Anyway, thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is a good friend and great person to be giving a talk here today, um, especially with all of the live bug uh, hunting we're doing. There's GE devices and Bird devices and Google devices over there, and they're all all those manufacturers are letting people do live bug hunting activities. Um, and so, with no more delay, Amit Azari will be giving a talk on issues that affect those types of activities and researchers like yourselves or those curious. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Um, is it already good afternoon? Good afternoon. I hope you're enjoying Hacker Summer Camp. I'm, I'm certainly uh, enjoying it. I'm having a lot of fun here with my sister and my colleagues from Intel. Again, uh, a free upgrade to all of you there in the back. If you would like to join us up here, uh, please grab a seat. Uh, we are about to begin. Uh, this is going to be a train into the regulatory landscape, so we're going to cover a lot of material. Uh, but I will try to take it slow, which is something I don't often do, but I'll definitely try for you all. And um, let me know if you have questions, you know, feel free to reach out. So how many of you here in the room have been to any of my other talks, seen my work, seen my research? You're my sister, so yeah. We, we have a bunch of hands here. So um, as those of you who know me know, um, because I'm Israeli, that's the accent, I want to start with a direct question. Uh, do you know this guy? Okay, we, we have a few hands here. Um, well, uh, this is Kevin Finster. Uh, Kevin is a friend. Um, he is a security researcher that, uh, that has certain expertise in the area of IoT. Um, he hacks drones, among others. Um, and he discovered the vulnerability uh, that, according to reports, uh, affected one of the JI products. Uh, and again, according to the media reports, um, exposed some of their uh, users' information. And when Kevin here wanted to report this vulnerability at the time, DJI just, uh, again, according to the reports, launched a bug bounty. Um, and that's the way they launched their bug bounty uh, with this kind of media report. And at the time, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a full-blown you know, bug bounty brief, like a contract with all the terms and all the scope. It was a little bit more kind of vague and limited. So Kevin contacted DJI. Um, you know, though he has lots of hair, he wanted to do the right thing. He wanted to wear the white hat. And he asked them, is this in scope? Um, and again, according to the reports, um, they indeed authorized that the vulnerability he found was in scope. Not only that, they offered him a nice bug bounty, $30,000. Any bug hunters here in the room? I think I know, I know a few. Um, that's a pretty high bounty. That's a nice bounty, right? And then the plot thickens. Um, and again, according to the reports, what we learned that because of some disagreements and how Kevin personally felt about certain letters that were exchanged in negotiations over the disclosures of the bounty, um, he decided to basically walk away from the process. In that letter, um, according to the reports, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act was mentioned. The Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, who knows this, this term, this law? I see a few hands, so for those of you who are not familiar, that's the federal anti-hacking law in the United States. Okay, so that's the, one of the main laws in the United States uh, that also has uh, international jurisdiction in certain circumstances that apply to unauthorized access to protected computers. Okay, just one of those, these laws. Um, so Kevin decided to not continue in the disclosure process and to walk away from an approved $30,000 bounty. Okay, um, and at the time, again, according to the reports, he actually ordered a Tesla uh, to celebrate this $30,000 bug and he had to cancel his order. Uh, and that's how the plot ended there. And at the time, and again, this is a lot of the prior work that I did at UC Berkeley, I will tell you a few words about myself in a moment. Uh, I felt this is a really interesting story because it flesh out not just the importance of the collaboration between the research ecosystem and, you know, corporation, companies, and the entire ecosystem, but also the importance of how the law plays into that collaboration, and how we should continue and work and build bridges between corporations and researchers, and kind of continue and refine and evolve the legal landscape that governs the area of bug bounties and vulnerability disclosure programs. And that's where a lot of my prior work uh, kind of focused before I joined uh, Intel, and I don't know if if uh, those of you in the room are familiar with that. So um, I'm going to be walking um, basically um, with you um, on 
these various topics, but I'm also going to talk today beyond anti-hacking laws also on how that, that landscape of bug bounties and VDP, vulnerability disclosure programs, relate to IoT and the broader evolving landscape of IoT security. Uh, so my name is Dr. Amit Lazari Barone. I recently graduated my doctoral degree from UC Berkeley. Uh, thank you so much. I actually graduated five months early to join the Intel because I'm very passionate about what we do there. And I also still teach at UC Berkeley in the Master uh, in Cybersecurity program. And at Intel, all of what we what I do is work very closely with our security organization as part of the corporate government affairs uh, group that works with governments around the world to inform policymakers around some of the challenges in the area of doing security policy, right? What, what are the experts in technology say? And basically, how can we work together uh, to address those challenges? But as a true lawyer, and since I do have my doctoral degree in the law, uh, there is a little bit of fine print. So of course, I have my disclaimer. Although I am trained as an attorney, I, don't, I am not practicing law in the United States, and I'm not your lawyer. So this is not legal advice. You should seek your own legal advice. If you're looking for some, EFF is, is a great resource to consider. And again, um, what I'm going to be talking today with you is my own personal opinions. Uh, so take that into account as well. And with that, let me go a little bit into the details. Why is this story about Kevin so important? We know that with the evolving attack landscape, the ecosystem collaboration with the researchers is going to be much more and more important. And we also know that researchers, security researchers, care and they think about the issue of the potential legal liability. So here's some data points for you. I, I don't know if you've seen those uh, research and surveys being done, but they're really important. So we know, for example, from a survey done by CDT, the Center for Democracy and Technology, that half of the researchers that were interviewed in that, in that report actually shared that fear of legal risks and specifically mentioning the DMCA, the other anti-federal uh, law, anti-hacking federal law in the United States and the CFAA has caused them to consider how they do research, even to change their research. We also know in another research that was conducted with more, with, with more than 400 researchers, that's a big sample, that 60% of them, six, six zero, reported that f a fear of, of legal risk is something they consider when they have already done the research, they, they hold the report, and they think on whether to disclose it to a vendor or not, right? So this serves to kind of really um, emphasize the need to build those bridges and also to think about what we do with that with respect to the legal landscape. How can we address those concerns of the research community? Uh, another interesting research uh, that was done by more academics actually showed that 22% 20, mentioned that at a certain time uh, they, they were actually potentially threatened with legal action. And I think the broader, the broader issue is not just you know, the culture itself, because I know uh, Intel and many other corpor corporations around the world, and especially in Silicon Valley, want to work with the ecosystem and actually incentivize and, and you know, uh, uh, distribute bug bounties and grants to work with the security ecosystem. But this, there is also a culture issue. There is a, a cultural, uh, there is a culture of legal risk that is embedded within the hacking community, which is a very important reason and what we need to walk and, and kind of talk on these things. We also know that 92% of researchers said that it would actually work with a vendor to responsibly disclose the vulnerability. And this is a key issue. Coordinated vulnerability disclosure is one of the most important things we need to talk about as we look at IoT sec security and the evolving uh, technological landscape being embedded. And 92 of the, of the uh, participants of the server say they would work with the, with the vendor and way they consider not to, it's mostly because of frustrations around communications, which suggests we need to continue and work on these issues. And how does this play out into the regulatory landscape? So believe it or not, VDP, the notion of having a vulnerability disclosure program, the notion of being able to put that channel of communication uh, to enable uh, researchers to provide you with reports and work with them is a key issue that regulators are thinking about, right? All these different regulators, for example, recommend having that practice, having that channel of communication. So when you, uh, you know, um, here in the room with us uh, are performing research, when you are finding things, you will have a security at email. You will have a detailed VDP that actually describes what should you expect when you try to work with a vendor to disclose. And all these different regulators, including the, the FTC, 
have actually uh, taken into account this issue and provided guidance, most notably, and we will talk about it in detail, the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice, the absolute experts on the CFAA and the anti-hacking uh, anti legal landscape, have actually provided a very detailed framework on how should we think about quantum vulnerability disclosures. So I'm going to talk about a little bit of that in, in um, uh, next, but what I want to highlight here that even the FTC, for example, in two cases, together with many other circumstances, okay, so this is not, um, you know, just one issue, but when they consider what is a sec reasonable security practice, which is a key term, and uh, have you heard this term? Reasonable security practice. This is a key term in the regulatory landscape of IoT, but more broadly in the federal security regulation landscape in the United States and even abroad. And when the FTC look, looks into you know, what to pursue and what is a reasonable security practice in at least two cases, among with other, uh, other things, they've actually mentioned this issue, that you need to have a process to receive and address security vulnerability reports from security researchers and academics. So I find that really uh, remarkable because it shows to, to kind of look at the evolving landscape and how VDP will become more and more and more regulated. I'm going to give you a little bit more data points on how, how that specifically relates to IoT security. And here it is. Uh, in the UK, uh, this is very, uh, one very interesting uh, kind of uh, evolving <laughs> landscape I recommend uh, you all to follow. They are actually put in forward uh, what they call a consultation. That's what they do when they think about a future law on IoT security focusing on consumer uh, and household IoT. And this is uh, something that, they've, that they have developed from their code of practice. Anyone here heard about the, the UK government code of practice for IoT security? Check it out. It's, it's a document outlining like 13 key kind of um, capabilities they think that uh, you should consider with respect to IoT security. And they've taken three of them. One of them is this notion that, you, that they should have a public point of contact for researchers. You should have that vulnerability disclosure program, the channel of communication. And they're looking into how uh, basically specifically regulating that. So we are seeing the IoT security regulatory landscape not just evolving, but becoming more and more embedded with this notion of VDP. And I think what this shows to say is that we recognize we will need an ecosystem, right? Without evolving landscape, we need the help of everybody involved, not just you know, the innovation and the technologists that we also do at Intel, but also the researchers. And that's why we need to also work on this idea of vulnerability disclosure programs. And how does the law interact into that? So I mentioned already the CFAA, I mentioned the DMCA, and I throw some terms at you, but I want to go a little bit into the details. So the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the CFAA, uh, really the key main federal anti-hacking law uh, here in the United States, but it really embodies this notion of unauthorized access. Have you heard about this term? It's a key term uh, that there is a circuit split in how this specific term should be uh, interpreted in different circumstances. Here in the United States, there is a, lot of, a little bit of vagueness around that, and a lot of uh, people discuss this vagueness. Uh, but this notion of unauthorized access is actually also embedded to some extent in the DMCA. The DMCA is another key federal anti-hacking law that you should be familiar with, especially if you're doing security researchers in IoT and embedded. Uh, this is basically an amendment to the copyright law that focus on uh, circumvention of protection measures that are geared to protect the code as copyright uh, protected uh, work. And this anti-circumvention law also has some prohibitions on unauthorized circumvention. Most notably, the DMCA is known for having a specific security research exemption. So today, uh, and I think this is amazing work done by many people that care about the community already in 2015, uh, recently renewed a DMCA exemption for security research. Now, when this um, exemption started, it really focused on good faith security research and there was device limitation uh, from that specific law. It was focused on uh, voting machines and automobile. Uh, I'm glad to report uh, that uh, the Copyright Office is actually considered to expand it and the DOJ, the Department of Justice, actually also gave comments uh, to the Copyright of Office and actually supported not only the renewal of this exemption that it allows for good faith security research, but actually the expansion 
of this exemption. So I think this is a really interesting thing to take a look at. Uh, and without going too much into the details, it's certainly something you want to explore and um, be knowledgeable about because there are certain requirements with respect to how the security needs to be done. Most notably in the 2018 revision, they removed the need to do the, the research in a controlled environment. And one of the key points, uh, if you look at the Copyright Office report, is that the security research ecosystem came to the Copyright Office and said to them, listen, research is not just being done in controlled labs and clear rooms. Research is being done right here. And this research could be beneficial for society. So actually, uh, they have removed this uh, controlled environment. They still have other, very other important considerations to take into account. Uh, and I encourage you, um, for example, by the way, that the research would avoid harm to individuals or the public, which is a key issue. Uh, and I encourage you to take a look. How this plays out into bug bounty and vulnerability disclosure programs. So, so that's a key issue. That's really, that was really my, the focus of my prior work at Berkeley before I joined Intel. I did a lot of research into the contracts of v bug bounties and vulnerability disclosure programs. Why? Because as I told you, anti-hacking laws really focus on this idea of authorizations. How many of you are pen testers? Or, or consultants, right? Usually you would have a contract, a contract that authorizes you know, your ability to test the products with many other uh, you know, different provisions with respect to under which circumstances and what are the terms and the like. This notion of authorization is also a key issue when we think about vulnerability disclosure programs and more importantly, bug bounties. So the way those contracts play out into this landscape is that, and as you will see, is that we kind of want to make sure that that, that notion of conversation does not under, is not undermined by the contract of the bug bounty of the VDP. And I will get to that. So I, I mentioned that the Department of Justice, the main experts on the CFAA, actually have a framework for vulnerability disclosure programs. Now, if, if there is something you walk out from this room today with respect to this part of the presentation, I really want to encourage you to take a look at this document. And I, believe me, it's only, by the way, it's only seven pages and it's very readable. So the Department of Justice, the good people, and this is led by Leonard Bailey, uh, he often comes to Hacker Summer Camp. I just met him yesterday. He gives talk at B-Sites. Uh, reach out to him, he's a really, really remarkable lawyer, uh, but also a great supporter of the security ecosystem. They've put forward this uh, basically framework that fleshes out the fact that if you think about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and the anti-hacking uh, anti -hacking legal landscape, yes, there are interactions with the CFAA, but generally this, this type of idea that we need to work together and there, there needs to be a channel of communication should be supported. It's a good practice. And they want to encourage corporations to do it, and that's, for, that's why they put together this framework that outlines a few key considerations that you need to think about when you do a framework. And I'm going to walk you through a bunch of them. Now, if you're in a corporation, you're considering a VDP, if you're a researcher, take a look at those issues and kind of look for them as you consider to report things. So first of all, they really describe the fact that you need to have clear, plain, easily understood terms. This idea of making sure that you're clearly communicating is key because we have researchers from all over the world, right? And it's already a very kind of complex ecosystem. So you want to make it as clear as possible. And they also talk about establishing boundaries, right? More and more it's important as this landscape evolves to be very clear. Where are the lines? What are the expectations? They also discuss the fact that you should be kind of taking it slow, make sure that you have the process and the backbone to support the VDP. And interestingly enough, they talk about the need to, to create a safe harbor, to think about what is the language, the specific language you're going to put in the VDP to make sure uh, that you address the legal concerns. Now, we talked about the fact that hackers think about it. We talked about the fact that researchers consider the legal risk. So you need to think about whether you're going to put in that language, for example, for provisions that you're saying, um, you know, we will not pursue legal action if you follow the terms. And this is something that comes from the Department of Justice of the United States. So I really, you know, encourage everybody to take a look at that document especially if you're considering you know, drafting a VDP and taking, look at, uh, taking into account you know, those issues. 
and I want to move along. Uh, I would just add that this issue of how we should think about the legal landscape of EDP is not only considered in the United States. This is a report uh, by the CEPS task force in Europe, and they also flashed out this, that this issue of the legal liability of security researchers should be clarified. Um, it's a different landscape in Europe, uh, but what we see here is that this is an international kind of uh, issue that many, um, you know, many different policy experts have flashed out around the world. Okay, and how does this play as out to my own work? Well, again, before I joined Intel, I did a lot of work on basically creating templates and standardizing this landscape, creating one contract uh, that companies can adopt that explicitly address these issues, and I encourage you to take a look. Maybe you heard about it. It's called Legal Bug Bounty. And I think more and more uh, organizations are looking how to basically we can develop the contractual landscape to support VDP. This is interesting work uh, done by Dropbox. They open sourced uh, something that is focused not just on the basically contractual interaction between the researcher and the company, but between the vendor and the company in the context of VDP and bug bounties, among others. So this is already on GitHub. Uh, this is open, and uh, it's from my good friends at Dropbox. You can take a look. And one more data point for you here, Disclose.io. I don't know if you heard about it. Um, uh, Chloe, my friend, is presenting it as well here at DEF CON. Uh, basically, while I, when I was doing this research I, research, I identified this gap, the fact that we don't have one open source license, an equivalent of that one contract in this landscape. There is fragment, fragmentation, and we need to harmonize that landscape. So I work with Backcrowd on this project called Disclose.io, and the idea is, again, to create an open source resource. So companies, organizations, and even researchers, when they are looking into you know, how VDP bug bounties should look like, they can take into that account. You should always you know, seek your legal advice because these are complicated landscapes. So this is just something you know, like a data point. But doing a VDP, doing a bug bounty, that's something that we have international standards uh, um, to guide you. And I think you know, it's important to do it right. And finally, and, and one area in which this connects with IoT is this specific issue. Uh, so I, as I was working on this research, I kind of I looked at uh, Tesla's bug bounty, and one of the things I noticed is they didn't have a safe harbor, and I flashed it out on, on uh, Twitter. This is before I joined Intel. And uh, it was a real joy. I worked for, for a couple of months with the team at Tesla, and they, in fact, changed their contracts. They added a safe harbor, but not only that, because they're so great, uh, uh, Yoni and the guys there, they even expanded it. And they added something that is really a novelty. Uh, especially in the IoT car embedded area. They added a provision saying that if you follow the terms of the bug bounty, not only if you follow the language, yes, it's important to read the terms. If you follow those terms, not only they will not pursue legal action and the, uh, and the uh, research is authorized, if for some reason your Tesla you know, gets broken, right, because security research, I assume that could happen. If you are an authorized researcher, and you are participating in a bug bounty, they will fix that Tesla for free. You can take it to the shop, they will fix it for free. So they waive the warranty limitations for participating in bug bounties. And I think this is, this is one of the key issues we're gonna see in embedded in IoT, in hardware, where we need more and more collaboration. Uh, and there are actual devices, uh, and you know, there are complexities. So I think this is really interesting I mean, a really interesting development and uh, uh, good for Tesla. And I'm also proud to say, and this is one of the main reasons I joined Intel, that we also have a bug bounty and we invite you all here to participate uh, and hack our, our hardware. Uh, and we're really focused on our collaboration with the security research uh, ecosystem. In fact, we have many of our hackers here at Hacker Summer Cap. We had trainer, trainers that participate in the, black, in the black hat trainings for hardware. And we also had one presentation concerning our own security research. So please take a look at that. And I want to move along and really kind of touch on uh, a few more interesting areas. So I really walked kind of briefly around the issues of anti-hacking laws and the VDP landscape, but there are key legal and regulatory developments that we are seeing in the area of IoT. One of the things that we have seen is an influx of regulation with respect to IoT security. Most notably, we have, we have already in California and in Oregon specific laws that are gonna come into effect on January 2020 on the issue of IoT security. Have you heard about these laws? Maybe the California law. Uh, it's most, most notably known as a, as a law that addresses no default passwords. 
Uh, but not only that, we ha also have proposed federal bills in the, in the area of IoT security, which is something really interesting to take a look at and monitor. And we also have uh, an, a key effort by NIST, right? Our, our key kind of uh, uh, leader when it comes to security uh, expertise on the federal level that is focusing on promoting an IoT security baseline. What are the kind of key, you know, things you should expect in with respect to IoT security devices. Uh, and they just released a new uh, report uh, last week, and I'm going to give you some highlights from that report. But that is one of the key developments we are seeing on not just not the regulatory, because NIST doesn't do regulation per se, but especially in terms of the harmonization and how you know, that key technical experts uh, federal body looks into IoT security. And from there, we're going to uh, you know, walk a little bit more into the details into the UK consultation if we have time. Uh, but this is really interesting. The California law going to take effect Gen January 2020 in California for devices sold in California. Uh, this potentially will have a big impact. And it's focusing on connected devices. Uh, and we will, we will talk a little bit about the definition of connected device. One of the key issues to look at when we think about the IoT security evolving landscape is how devices are being defined. Right? We want to define them in a way that comports with innovation, that doesn't undermine innovations, while supporting the importing security capabilities. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Now, this law basically specifically requires reasonable security features for, for uh, connected devices. And we're going to talk about the definitions. And it, it fleshes out the fact that if that device has a means of authentication, one way to achieve reasonable security is by, by basically taking out this notion of default password, by requiring a unique pre-programmed password uh, into the device or a way for the user to choose their own uh, password, a unique password when the device uh, is forced being used. Uh, a little bit into kind of the definitions because I want to also compare this to the Oregon law. And again, this law will come into effect January 2020, so it's really coming uh, very soon. Uh, interestingly enough, the definition of connected device talks about devices that are capable of connected to the internet, directly or indirectly, and has assigned IP address or Bluetooth address. As we walk through the definition in the Oregon law, you will notice there are a little bit of different um, uh, kind of uh, provisions there. So the Oregon law um, is also already signed, will come into effect also very soon. And interestingly enough, it has very similar requirements. It's kind of a mirror law, but that law is focused on household uh, and consumer-focused uh, consumer devices. And uh, it has very, you know, in terms of the actual requirements of reasonable security, which is a key term that we also seen on the federal level from the FTC and many other places, uh, it, the, the approach and the definition is a, bit of a, a little bit different, right? It's, not, it's a device or other physical object, which that's the same that not, is not capable of connecting, because that's a little bit vague, but connects, right? Um, directly or indirectly to the internet, and is used primarily for personal, family, or household purposes, and is assigned an internet protocol address or another address or number that identifies the connected device for the purpose of making a short-range wireless connections to another device. So you see that in that relay already, the organ, uh, organ state took a different approach, not just naming specific IP addresses or Bluetooth addresses, but expanding a little bit the definition. Uh, I really encourage you to track this. I think this is really, uh, you know, remarkable developments in the area of IoT security, certainly on the state level. We know that there are mural laws that are being proposed uh, in different states. And I think one of the key issues we need to be mindful about is, again, these are devices, these are whole systems, these are not components. And uh, we should really, when we are thinking about regulating this area, to foster security, we need to also be mindful about the technical realities, right? We need a dialogue between the technical experts, between the security researchers and the regulators to make sure that we define uh, the, the terminology in an appropriate way that fosters innovation and is also mindful to the fact that this is a very evolving technological landscape. Okay, why do we have on a federal landscape? I don't know if you heard about this law. It's not a law yet, sorry, it's a bill. Uh, uh, it's, not, it's not passed. Uh, we have two proposed bills, um, one in the House side, one on the Senate side, uh, with some differences between them that are focusing on IoT. The, the, the bill is called the IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act, uh, and it's really focusing on driving the security baseline that I talked about that NIST is developing through federal procurement. 
Okay? This is the idea that if the government requires a certain requirements, then uh, they want to basically use that federal procurement to kind of push uh, uh, the security uh, requirements across the board, across industry. Uh, it's an interesting development. Uh, as I mentioned, they want to utilize government procurement. And most notably, um, the law also has a, a, a big CVD section. Both, both proposed, uh, uh, both of bills, sorry. Both the House and Senate has a section that talks about quote and vulnerability disclosure uh, within the government. And they reference as well uh, the international standards. And, and the bill suggests that uh, as you know, pr uh, best practices and as guidelines are being developed in this area, it's very important to align them with international standards. And uh, I think this is one of the key uh, other messages that we are going to see the CVD landscape develop. And it's very important that we continue and kind of look at industry best practices uh, because industry has been leading the way in that regard um, and working with the whole ecosystem for decades, but also that we have uh, international standards in this area that are really fleshed out, that consensus-based, both of the ISOs, uh, great work done by Katie Missouris and others, and, and I encourage you to take a look at that. We are seeing those ISO standards being referenced uh, in proposed bills, and I think it's very important that we continue and harmonize uh, the landscape in that regard. What else? Okay, so I talked a little bit about uh, the NIST effort. I think this is a key, uh, really recent development uh, NIST started this, I think they first released their first draft, there was a report, but the first draft really focusing on the IoT security baseline capabilities, that's how they call it, on February, then there was a workshop on March, and just last week, fresh out of the oven, uh, they released another draft that is much more fleshed out, 38 pages. Uh, really interesting, take a look. They're looking into some key uh, uh, baseline capabilities that, they're think, that they think are uh, important when you think about IoT security, device identification, device configuration, uh, data protection, logical access, and more. And it's a technical, more technical document, but there is a free page blog uh, that can walk you through it. Uh, and I think you know, that is a very remarkable effort. I'm proud to say that we Intel uh, provided comments to that. I'm going to be uh, going next week uh, uh, to... Uh, to the area of Washington, D.C., uh, to Maryland, to also kind of uh, participate in that workshop. Uh, and that's the kind of effort, you know, the consensus-driven um, um, collaborations that we're going to need in order to address, you know, the different challenges we see in that, lands in that landscape. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really remarkable effort where you see a lot, of in a lot of industry experts coming together with government, with regulatory bodies, with uh, bodies like NIST, with the technical experts of NIST, sitting together and flashing out, you know, what are the different uh, baseline capabilities we would need to be taking a look at. And one of the most inter interesting things that they highlight is that this is going to be different for different sectors sectors and different verticals. And I think for IoT, a landscape which is still evolving, uh, we have great connectivity with a lot of great value that is coming to society, but we have different uh, verticals and different sectors. Uh, I think this idea of having that contextability of application in various environments uh, is really important. Uh, so take a look at that. Uh, that, by the way, that effort, a version of it, is referenced in, our proposed, in the proposed bill uh, on the federal level. So we're already seeing at least one bill looking into this effort as a, something uh, really interesting to follow. And I mentioned before this, the code of practice of consumer IoT in UK. I just bring this to, as one example. I know the governments of the world are looking into uh, basically this issue of IoT security. And this is just one effort by the UK government really putting together a code of practice for IoT. Actually, uh, they also came here to the hacker summer camp to hear from the security researchers, to hear from the community. And I had uh, the pleasure of hearing their presentation and, and engaging to discuss their next step, uh, the UK consultation on this issue. And and they've put together a code of practice that also talks about 13 key, key kind of uh, things to think about when you're looking into IoT security. This is consumer focused. And they've taken this to the next step, proposing a consultation for a potential future law. Again, focusing on three key issues. Uh, the, the, the unique password issue that we have also seen in California and Oregon. Um, 
the notion of having that uh, point of contact, right? We talked about the VDP, the notion of the fact that you're going to have a security ad or point of contact that researchers can uh, basically know where to reach out to you when they find things. And this idea um, uh, around this issue of security updates, right? Which is also uh, a key issue that we are seeing in many proposed uh, efforts in this area. So that's another very interesting thing to take a look at. And I think when it comes down to there is a real opportunity. And that's why one of the things that I'm really passionate about. So I talked about the opportunities to foster that ecosystem, to foster that collaboration with the security research community. That's something that I think you know, we, we all uh, work on very hard and is very important. But there is also an opportunity for innovation. There is opportunity for technologies that are pushing uh, security uh, in IoT and beyond. And there is really the opportunity to focus on this issue of, of trust, trust that goes all the way into you know the fundamental right uh, the, the foundations um, and I think you know just sharing with you very honestly that's one of the reasons why I joined Intel because there is an opportunity to affect impact on a very foundational level and as we think about that I think you know we, we should think about what are the technologies what are the leadership that we can uh, create in that areas so I talked a little bit about the capabilities and you know at Intel part of what we do is we think about security and social essential specifically in IOT um, and we have a bunch of capabilities that are looking into, you know, taking those capabilities, this idea, into the, to the next level, into the foundation. So things like, um, you know, secure device onboarding, uh, which is a non-default <laughs> password uh, uh, notion of onboarding devices. Things like how we can uh, have hardware acceleration for cryptographic protections. Uh, things like uh, how we can protect keys and platform integrity and just generally trustworthiness, right? Uh, so I'm not the technical experts on this issue, but I did want to give you a little bit of these ideas, uh, with most notably this idea that there is an opportunity, there is an opportunity for innovation, and with that, uh, I want to finish it off and leave time for questions.